All right, uh, congratulations to the award recipients. Uh, now let's uh, get started uh, with our uh, I2 Reseda uh, Distinguished Lecture. Today uh, I have uh, a great pleasure and honor uh, to introduce our speaker, uh, Professor uh, Mary Jean Ren from um, uh, Penn State University. Uh, she is actually a leader in our computing community. I think she needs very little introduction. But let me just say a few words. Uh, she got actually an extremely distinguished career for more than, I think, about 40 years at Penn State. And uh, she actually has worked on a lot of uh, excellent work. Uh, 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 just to keep everything short, she is a member of U.S. National uh, Academy of Engineering. He's, she is also a member of uh, American Academy of Arts and uh, Sciences. Let's please uh, uh, welcome uh, Professor Oren. It looks like a little bit of a mystery talk because I didn't think about the fact that you can't read the title from out there, so I can't. Okay, good, so I won't be tethered except I'm tethered by this. And I think even my classroom voice won't work in a room this, this large, so. Thank you very much for the invitation and for the chance to speak. I'm going to talk uh, about work that was done long ago and lessons learned and project forward to what's happening today. And, uh, lessons that you may be able to take advantage of in the, the technologies and research that's going on today. Um, my official name is Mary Jane. Uh, my nickname is Janie. The only time I got called Mary Jane at home by my mother was when I was in trouble. Right? So Janie is just fine. Okay, Go back to eight, 1986. How many people were not alive in 1986? Okay. How many people were alive but still in K through 12? Right? So it's about half the room. That's kind of what I figured. So uh, put that in perspective as I'm talking. But by 1986, I call it the stars were aligned. I was a... a Recently promoted associate professor at Penn State. So I started at Penn State in 77, so I truly did spend my 40th year in the classroom this year. Um, and I had been recently promoted and tenured, and so it was time to take on some risk and to do some projects that had a little longer lifespan. When you're trying to get promoted and tenured, you're sort of focused on trying to get those results out in those publications so you have the right number of papers on your CV when you go up for promotion. I also had graduated my first PhD who'd gone off to industry and had come back uh, for a couple years and had come back as a junior faculty at Penn State. And so we worked very well together and we were both interested in doing a building project that was going to take, we knew, take multiple years. We didn't quite know it was going to evolve into what it did evolve into. But, and we were, we were determined we were going to do some real building. CMOS was the new technology. We had gone the summer before to a summer school taught by Mark Horowitz and, uh-oh, the, the name has gone blank. Anyway, Mark was one of the people teaching it. Uh, we spent two weeks out at ISA. I think Shishpal was involved in that particular workshop as well. CMOS was the brand new technology and they were teaching us how to teach CMOS in the classroom. So how to do the design, how to work with the tools, et cetera. Oh, Chuck Seitz was the other person that was teaching that. And it was quickly taking over. So think about that as part of the stars that were aligned. We had gotten funding from the Army Research Office, kind of a surprising place to give us funding for our first building project, and then from NSF for our second projects that we were working on. This took up about 15 years of my life, if you count the two projects, because there were two generations of each of them. And Moses had emerged as a place to get fabrication done at an affordable price at near scale of what industry was doing. So about the same time that we were able to get two micron designs done by Moses, um, Intel had produced uh, their current processor generation, 86 processor generation, and one and a half microns. I'm saying microns, not nanometers, right? Everybody knows what a micron is, right? And we had a team of great graduate students. They're the centerpiece 
I think, still the centerpiece for all of these sorts of projects. You can do a project this size if you don't have great labor working for you, and they're great, and great idea generators as well. So who knows what, what constellation this is? Ah, Orion. There it is. And that's the only constellation I can find reliably in the night sky. So it had to be Orion. I can sometimes find the Big Dipper, but not always. So our first design project, which is the one where I'm going to spend most of my time. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the second one because I do want to come to the looking forward uh, part. So our first project we call the arithmetic cube. The first thing is find a, find a fancy name for it, right? Uh, so people will remember it. And arithmetic cube certainly described what it was doing. It was for doing co uh, computing discrete Fourier transfers, not FFTs, but DFTs and cyclic convolution, convolution based on these algorithms that were first proposed by Radner in 68 and then expanded on by Winograd called the small n algorithms. What they were trying to do and what everybody was trying to do at this time was reduce the number of multipliers because silicon area was precious and multipliers took up a lot of area and, a lot of, and they ran slow. And so try to reduce the number of multipliers that you use. So to do the DFT on the vector input vector x, what you do is you put it through a series of operations of, by matrices. So the first matrix is T, which defines the input, adds, and subtracts. So the important thing about T is it's a matrix, yes, but it only consists of zeros, ones, and minus ones. So it's adds and subtracts. Then there's a diagonal matrix C. That's the multiplication step, right? And it's a strictly a diagonal matrix that defines the small n multiplications. So that tells you how many multiplies there are. But they come out serially, so you really only need one multiplier if you've designed it correctly. And then there's an output matrix, uh, S, that defines the output adds and subtracts. Once again, it has only zeros, ones, and minus ones. So you're trading many fewer multiplies for lots of adds. But we had a way to do these adds very quickly and in, and in a compact area. Area was one of the number one design, maybe not the number one. Performance was important, too. But it was a primary design constraint in 1986. They had defined algorithms for the first the low prime numbers, and then people had expanded on it. In fact, 25 came out after we started on this project. So we set our, our, our goal at being able to do um, up to small ends of 23. And these matrices are, were defined in the literature, so we didn't have to come up with them. They're well defined. And if you'd had to do bigger DFTs, you could use compositions of smaller sequences. So we could do large ones as well. I'll give you a runtime of that. Um, this picture is really fuzzy. I could have redrawn it, but what I did was I went to the original paper and pulled it out of that. Uh, original papers back in 1986, remember these things that you used to touch the keys and they actually caused a hammer to come out and print on the paper called typewriters? That's how we did papers in the old days, and we had to put them on these big form factors and mail them in for conference proceedings. You couldn't do it, you know, three minutes before the deadline at midnight. You had to take into account the U.S. Postal Service, and if you were overseas, even worse, okay? So this is just for the input adder, and it's an array of adders, no surprise. Um, and I'm going to use the word digits of precision rather than bits, and you'll see why in a little bit. So this looks like a pretty regular layout. It is pretty regular. It's mostly systolic, that is mostly nearest neighbor, and, and information pulses through it. It's actually semi-systolic because you can see some broadcast lines in there. And there are no multipliers in this picture. You can't see the little pluses. I can barely see them up here. But each of those is a digit adder. Not a full precision adder, but a digit adder. So let's look at one of those. Whoops. So the matrix T comes in the top, and the digits of the vector come in the side, from the least significant on the bottom row to the most significant digit on the top row. So there's an adder cell, once again, taken out of the original paper. And you can see the inputs, the elements of T come in at A. One digit element of X comes in, and then the, the accumulation comes out of Z. It gets it, gets it from its um, left neighbor and sends the result to its right neighbor, so that's the accumulation for the, for the matrix. I'll call it multiply, but remember, it's really just adds and subtracts. And then there's this carry that comes in the bottom and goes out the top. So if you look at what's happening in a column, that's your adder. That's your full precision adder. So we had a carry that ripples from the least significant into the most significant. And we know how to save area, right? This is going to be pretty efficient to lay out once we've done the design of each of those cells, and then we just duplicate them, replicate them. 
Um, but the problem is, is we won't be able to run it very fast because it's a, it's a ripple carry adder. And you can build faster adders, but then your regularity structure goes away. Well, now, now the teacher in me comes out. How to make the ad fast. I teach a computer arithmetic course at the graduate level that there are a few people in this audience have taken. So the worst case carry time ripples from the least significant end to the most significant end, right? Well, if you consider a base 10 example first, because I find it easier to explain in base 10, you have your add in and your aug in, and yes, that's what they were called back in elementary school. And this is an example that has a carry that ripples from the least significant end to the most significant end. So if you were doing this in pencil and paper and you didn't have your calculator or your phone handy, um, and you were trying to compute the sum, first you'd add 8 and 4, and you get 12 and add the 1 to the 9, et cetera, you see. And the carry ripples truly from the least significant end to the most significant end. Too slow, too slow. So what we're going to do is do weird arithmetic, right? throughout the whole adder array and don't have to convert it back to binary until we're done. So we use sign digit arithmetic is what it's called, something that um, my thesis advisor when I was at Illinois did a lot of foundational work in. So what we're going to do is we're going to do two steps, a two-step addition. First, we're going to translate the sum of the add-in and aug into two terms, one called the interim sum and one called the interim carry, and then we're going to add those two together. We're going to be able to do that almost in parallel. The carry is going to ripple one position. The rules are that the interim sum can be in the range of minus 8 to plus 8. Minus 8, but not minus 9. And the interim carry can be in the range minus 1 to plus 1. So I'm going to do this starting at the most significant end to make the point, right? So 3 plus 4 is 7. Well, that's pretty easy, right? 7 with no carry. I didn't want to have a carry to have to deal with. 6 plus 7 is 13. Well, let's see. Interim carry of 1, interim sum of 3. That's pretty easy. 0 plus 9 is 9. Uh, interim carry of 0, interim sum of 9. Oops. Oops. I can't do that because I broke the rules. So let's see. How can I represent 9? I can represent it as a carry of 1 and a sum of minus 1. That's still 9, right? A carry of 1 is 10, minus 1. So I recode it as that. 8 and 4 is 12. Now notice that I can I can do that. I can do that in parallel across all four digits at the same time. I pass the carry one position, and then I'm guaranteed I can do the second add step, which is add the interim sum and the interim carry together with no carry going out. So there's the sum in parallel. So I only I can limit my carry propagation to one one digit position by using this sign digit representation. So what we did was we came up with a constant time adder design and we did it for base four because it's, uh, it's easier to understand and explain to the students. You can do them for base two, but they're pretty tricky to explain and understand. And um, so we're doing base four. That means X can be in the digit set minus three to plus three. So yes, it takes me three bits to represent it. Sorry, it cost me a little extra in wiring. Right? The carry propagates only one digit position. I can increase the precision. I can add more rows to my adder array, and it doesn't affect the time, right? If I've got the area, I just add more rows to the adder array, and I extend the precision of my operands. Uh, converting from two's complement to uh, redundant, uh, maximum redundant rate X4 is trivial, right? There's nothing, no real work that has to be done. If I want to go back to two's complement at the end, I just have to ripple the carry. There are other things like, Zero is still a unique representation. It's the, bit, the digit string all zeros. The sign of the most significant digit is the sign of the number. There are other, other things that are handy that come in when you're looking at other sorts of operations. So if I look at two of my interim sum and interim um, and, and total, I'm calling it total units here, interim sum carry and the total unit, and I think about base three digits, there's one that would cause the, the in a normal adder for the adder to ripple all the way. I know the sum of 3 plus 3 is 6, right? That tells me it's a, a, sum of, a sum of 2 and a carry of 4, which goes to the next position, right? Once it goes to the next position, it becomes a 1, right? 1 plus 2 is 3, and I'm done. So I, I, can, I can handle that arithmetic and, and show the example again. It's true that I will have negative and positive digits represented in here throughout my array. When I need it back in two's complement, 
I just ripple to carry, but I'm going to maintain it and sign digit all the way through my adder array. There's my carry, one digit position. Okay. So here's, I used to have lots of quotes in here. I took them all out, but this is one of my favorite. If war were, with, uh, were, if war were arithmetic, the mathematicians would rule the world. Uh, okay. Anybody guess? I know somebody knows because we talked about it at the table over here. Okay. My students usually can figure this out, the undergraduates at least. Okay. Anybody watch Game of Thrones? Come on. Some people have watched Game of Thrones. <laughs> yeah. This is from Game, Game of, a quote from Game of Thrones, so, which I'm re-watching slowly. It's long, too long. Okay, so we knew what we wanted to build, and we knew how to make it fast, and we were hoping it was going to be fairly small because area is important. And all we had to do was design one cell, the adder cell. Well, it's the inside of the adder cell, so that's all we had to do. But what we had available as far as tools was something called Expressa, which was a minimum sum of products tool, right? And we had to do technology mapping by hand. There were no tools out there, okay? So think back to those days, or think back to when, if, if they took your logic synthesis tools away from you and you had to do it by hand. And we wanted to use more than just NANs, NORs, and inverters. We wanted to use the power of CMOS. And we set our sights on we were going to have, allow any gate that had no more than two transistors in series. So we wanted to be able to support and or inverters of two kinds and or and inverters of two kinds. And there's our complete logic set in CMOS. And the, the gates take about the same amount of time, except the inverter, of course, is faster. So we wanted to, to design with these gates, and we wanted to have multi-level logic in these cells, because we knew insisting on doing it in two levels was not going to work. It was going to take up too much area. We wanted to have multi-level logic, and we wanted to be able to share gates across the output functions. Right? So Bob and I, oh, in, in, in the 80s, area was a first-class design constraint, as I've said. So we needed an optimized design to maximize the number of adder cells we can put on the chip and to get the pre best performance, right? We've helped with the gate type, having no more than two transistors in series, but now we've got to worry about gate delay. How many, how many logic levels do we have to go through? So Bob and I started this nightly competition to see who could come up with, by hand, the design with the fewest number of transistors. We'd, we'd go away and work, and we'd come back in in the morning and compare notes, and we'd go away and work, and we'd come back in the morning and compare, compare count. And I was winning, which irritated the hell out of Bob. So what did he do? He cheated. He went and wrote a program that did an exhaustive search to find the minimum sum of the minimum multi-level logic using those constraints. Well, he started on it. Uh, we worked on it for uh, and, and graduate students for several years after that and improved it. Um, so that was the outcome of this competition. So, and it was a great outcome. And this was a tool that we used for many years at Penn State and that some of our graduate students got uh, addicted to and wanted when they went off to faculty positions of their own, really wanted to take a copy with them, and they did. So our first DAC paper in 97, and this started as a building project, remember? We didn't start off this project wanting to do design tools. We did the design tool out of necessity because there wasn't anything out there and we knew what we needed to have. So it's a multi-level logic synthesis tool that did recursive enumeration, enumeration of each function. So it had a decomposition stage that decomposed it uh, following the design constra the constraints and then a composition that put things back together. So the input, of course, was the set of Boolean function equations. The output was a logically equivalent but optimal in number of transistors set of factored of equations conforming to the constraints. And the constraints were the maximum number of allowable logic levels. So we gave it a logic level constraint. And uh, we wanted to control gate fan out, so we added that. That wasn't an original feature. That was something we added later because we knew that affected delay. We didn't want to have to play gate sizing games. The gate library, we had already decided what our gate library is. Uh, no more than two transistors in series, but you could expand it. It just means it has to work harder. And uh, a limit of six bits of input and six bits of output because we wanted to get an answer in our lifetime. Okay? And this worked for us because our basic cells were small, 
They had less than 40 transistors each and fit the input and output constraints. It doesn't work in general. I don't recommend an exhaustive search approach for everything. But if you're really worried about transistor counts and you can break your design down into small enough components, this works really well. And like I said, our students, once we turned it loose into the classes, they use logician a lot. Okay, there was no such thing as Verilog or VHDL. No such thing as Verilog or VHDL. So eventually we came up with an input-output language that worked for all of our tools. And we did this fairly early on. It wasn't the first thing we did with Logician, but it came pretty soon after. And we called it Glue for a gate language. Another cute name. Right? And if you look at it, it's hierarchical, and it looks very, to me, it looks very Verilog-ish, but maybe that's because I've looked at both of them too long. So you can see the definition of the or end inverter at the bottom. It's got a pull-down chain and a pull-up chain, right? Um, and you put those together, so you define the primitive gates, and then you um, define at the higher level how they're, how they're put together. So that was the input language and the output language of Logician. The input, of course, we did our minimum sum of products through Expresso and described it as glue and sent it to, to Logician, and Logician came out with the uh, multi-level logic, minimum multi-level logic description. Okay, this is a little bit about exhaustive search in 1986. Machines were slow. We thought they were great, fast, but compared to today, they were slow. Even, our, even for our relatively new VAX 11780, it had a 200 nanosecond cycle time, a 5 megahertz clock. These were, these were great numbers in those days, right? 2 k bytes of cache and 40 megabytes of memory. We thought we were in heaven, right? I'm sorry, 4 megabytes, not 4D, 4. Okay, so that was, that was the machine we had to run it on. It was written in C, of course. And it took two weeks for the VAX to compute the logic for I sum in total for our adder cell. Two weeks. The hard part was keeping the machine up and running continuously for two weeks. We had to restart several times. The other hard part was talking to our colleagues and saying, please don't use the machine right now. Give us time to get this solution out, right? And then we worked and improved the performance of the tool. But early on, it was... It, it, it was, it was slow because there were some optimization, optimizations that needed to be done. And we did that improvement. And, of course, machines got faster. So as both of those things happened, it turned into a very practical tool for lots of people to use. Okay. Now we've got the logic description for each of our cells. Now what we need to do is do the layout. For CMOS layout by 86, we moved over to using magic. That's what we used in that summer course that we took. Running on Sun workstations, developed by Joan Oysterhout. There's still versions of that, commercial versions of that out. And it's grad students at UCB. It did uh, online design rule checking, so you knew when you'd made a mistake. And you could do circuit extractions from layout, so you could run spy simulations to check your work. And there were simulation, switch level simulation tools out there. Randy Bryant had one uh, called MOSIM, which was a great tool which we used. We also had two valid logic boxes, which we used for doing printed circuit board design that were generously donated to us by Valid. Um, the printed circuit board tool is called Allegro. Um, Valid got something in return. They had a program that they really wanted to use, which allowed you to connect Unix machines to IBM machines, uh, networking-wise, um, that Bob had written. And um, they wanted to sell these boxes to IBM. So should we continue? To, we were doing gate matrix layouts. Um, should we continue to do the layouts by hand using magic or develop an automatic cell generation tool? And so that was the next tool, because then we could do logic synthesis on logician, feed the output of that to artist, and do layout, and we could do it quickly. Okay. So th then we have artist, which is the companion tool to, to logician, which we started both of them about the same time. They were a dual project. The publication on artist came later. It was a simulated annealing tool that did gate placement and interconnect using uh, mesh arrays. Uh, the input was the, the glue description that came from logician or that we wrote. Didn't have to be minimized. The output was a mesh array layout for that description and the constraints were the design rules. Um, we were doing version six at the time, I think. Um, number of well folds, and you'll see what I mean by well folds, although you probably know, and then how long to run it. And the bigger the circuit, you wanted to give it more iterations to run because it's the simulated annealing tool. 
This is not an optimal tool, obviously, but one that does a pretty good job. There's a mesh array for OR and inverter 2.2, once again, taken out of the original papers, non-color, so you can't tell anything about this, but you can tell it's a mesh array. And uh, you also can't tell anything about its size. I should have probably tried to sketch in there what was what. And this became a project of its own. Our cell generation work continued into the 90s. Uh, the first paper was in DAC uh, 98 on, on artist. We also had a paper in DAC 92. But more than that, we took it to um, ISPD, the Physical Design Conference, which was running competitions at the time. They had a bunch of um, modules that they would say, lay this out using these design rule constraints from this generation and tell us your area. And so we would do that and enter the competition. And artists did very well in those competitions. So we competed for a number of years and did various, very, in the DAC 92 paper, there are four different generations of artists or four different versions of artists that we compare. So it became another project in and of itself. But it was really nice to be able to run the logic synthesis and then do the layout very quickly and do lots of design comparisons, lots of experiments, trying different tweaks on, on the design, although the arithmetic cube was pretty set. Okay, so there's uh, a photomicrograph. These were the days when you could actually look at a photomicrograph and see something, right, other than big blobs. Okay, this is the digit adder mesh array for a one cell um, radix 4 uh, adder. So this is one adder in a mesh array. Right? Uh, and we did that, fabricated it, and tested it. Oops, I'm sorry. And it has two well folds, so here's a description of well folds, right? You can see the well fold in the middle, right? So we, instead of having to do having to do the, we're trying to optimize power and ground delivery, right? So we did well folds, turned them upside down. Also the in, 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 the in uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the wells, the P well for the end transistors uh, for the two middle columns could be shared. So that's the optimal way to do that. Okay, so here are some test chips. We did more test chips. These were fab by Moses. Moses was very affordable. Um, this is the one on the right that I'm showing is the arithmetic cube one. You can see these columns of something. Those are latches, pretty easy to spot. They're not mesh arrays. They were hand-drawn, hand-configured latches for controlling flow of logic through the columns. Um, there were two columns in my, our adder array, so it could only do, it could only do two, count of two uh, matrix, S and T matrices. But there's six rows, so, and remember it's a base, base two, right, base four, sorry. So there are two bits or two, two, well, I'll call them bits, two binary bits per row. So it's 12-bit precision if you talk about the precision. There's um, arithmetic cube two. It's changed structure. You can see that um, artist has changed its style considerably, and we changed the style of the flow. So in fact, you can't spot the latches in this anymore. They're all embedded. So, but it's once again six rows, so 12 bits. This time we have four columns, and you can pick out the columns, right? So it's getting bigger and bigger. We got a little carried away with this tool thing, right? So we put together a whole bunch of tools. At the bottom are logician and artist that I've already talked about, which were our workhorse tools. Uh, we used uh, MossSim and Spice for doing verification that the layout matched the logic description. Right? and ran simulations through them. We also did, uh, I'm sorry, that the, that the, yeah, doing the comparison across the two. And we also built a verifier to make sure that the layout and the algebraic description verified against one another. At the upper level, although I haven't given you a justification for how we used it, at least for the arithmetic cube, but we were looking at other structures, once again, regular structures like the arithmetic cube uh, and we looked at a number of different applications, and we wanted to have a tool that would decompose them into these units that I've shown you for the arithmetic cube, and then something to put together the layouts when they were generated by artists. And we needed to be able to verify and simulate that both directions again. So we had a whole team of graduate students working on tools by this point in time. Our test plan, Shishpa will love this one. Here was our test plan. We had no test plan. <laughs> we 
fabricated that and tested it, and it worked. And then we put a bunch of them together. These aren't the same generation, so please forgive me there. But we, we did that for, for that cell as well. When you end up with a whole stack of photomicrographs, and it's been 30 years since you've looked at them, or 40 years, and you look through them and try to figure out what's what, it, it's, a real, it's a real challenge. But once we tested, we tested at the unit, and we put together several units, and then we tested the whole thing, and that was our test plan. Um, so, and fortunately, it worked. So. Okay, so the specs for the arithmetic cube two, it was, um, it took 12 84 pin uh, chips, two micron, each containing a four by six array of adder cells. So that gave us 24 bit precision by 24 columns, which is all we needed if we didn't realize that small N algorithm for, for 25 was out there or didn't want to use it. It fit on a huge board by today's standards, but these were standard boards back then. 9U, fit in the sun, BME backplane, right? And it consisted of a lot of stuff. So there were memory chips for all the matrices and for the input and output vectors. In the, and we ran out of time. Our goal was to do, do not only the adder arrays but the multiplier using um, this sign digit arithmetic. But we ran out of time and energy to do the multiplier. So we just bought an off-the-shelf multiplier, converted to two's complement, and let the off-the-shelf with an adder, simple adder, and let the um, multiplier do the multiplier chip do the multiplier. Comparing performance, the arithmetic cube ran at 10 megahertz, and it could do 1,008. Remember, this has to be com compositions of small ends um, in about three and a half milliseconds. And commercial parts at the time for Motorola and TI ran in excess of 30 me megahertz and did 1,024 because they were standard uh, DFT computers in four milliseconds. So we were competitive at a third the clock rate. Thought that was pretty good. There's the team. Uh, I think you can probably recognize that person down there on the side, although that was a while ago, and I still have that blouse in my closet, if you believe it. Um, in the middle is Bob. Uh, he passed away in 97. And uh, on his right is Mohan Vishwanath. He also uh, passed away several years ago. Uh, Ramander Bajwa is on Bob's left. Is probably the opposite for you. <laughs> um, and he, uh, he is now, he's, he's been in several startups. He is now working with Norm Jopi at Google on the TPU uh, processor. That he's one of, the one of the designers there. And Tom Kelleher is down the bottom. He's a faculty member at a four-year college in Pennsylvania. So that's the team. I blew up the board. That's a pretty big board, right? That's the standard 9U board. That's what everybody designed with. Um, and you, I blew it up, and of course it got really fuzzy, and I probably should have drawn a circle around it, but you can see the part that we did, the custom chips. Those are the Moses chips. Okay, but, but it really takes a much bigger village than just those five people. We had a horde of mostly PhD students, but not all PhD students. Um, Tom Remender, Mohan, Chaitan and Agendra, and Paul Kelcher, Kevin Aiken, and Eric Gales. Some of you may know Eric, he uh, was at IBM for a while, and um, I, I'm sorry, he was at Intel for quite a long while, actually, and now he's also at Google. I think he's still at Google. They move around so fast, I can't keep track of them. Uh, tools, uh, Chu San Fu, who's back in Taiwan, Su Hong Kim, who may ring a bell for some of you. He was in the EDA industry and still is. I think he's, he's either with Mentor or Cadence, or Synopsis, who could keep track? Uh, Palpo is the same way. Ting Ting Wang is back in Taiwan uh, at Tsinghua, and we're also um, a minister without portfolio for the government. I think that's her official title. Manjit Bora is also in the CAD industry in California, who's EFA as well, and Shishpal's sitting over here. So, algorithms, you can read the list of names. Uh, eventually, we started working with colleagues at the University of Pittsburgh, most notably Steve Levitan, when we switched over from GLUE to VHDL, at least at the higher level. Um, I really miss Steve at DAC in particular. And currently in hardware design, there's VJ, who was sitting back in the back here, but he may be off working. Oh, there he is. Uh, Yuan, who was also here, and maybe he's got various... Oh, there he is over there. Although now he's at UCSB, but we still claim him. 
Uh, Jack Sampson, who I thought was going to be here, but maybe is not yet, um, who's a junior faculty who joined us, who's a computer architect, but we've pulled him over to the dark side, right? Or maybe it's the light side. And Sumandata, who we also claim, even though he left Penn State uh, a couple years ago, who's now at uh, Notre Dame. So, and we still work with all of those people. Our next design project, I'm going to go really quick because I know people have things planned, uh, was the micrograin array processor. It was a mesh array, once again, of nearest neighbor connected small PEs containing a little bit of RAM, a few dedicated registers, and the logic and arithmetic controlled by multiplexers. What does this sound like? It sounds like FPGAs connected with only nearest neighbor interconnect. And that's essentially what it was. And it was a much, it was a programmable platform, so there was lots of application software development and testing that we had to do. We created a language for it, for creating MBAT codes for complex parallel algorithms. We designed our mesh so you could run it in rows or columns to represent your full precision value, or in squares, or in snakes, you know, you got a little carried away there too. Uh, we essentially use the same design tools that we developed for the arithmetic cube. Um, so I'm not going to go over this in detail except to point out um, the number of chips was constant, 32, so it's going to really fill up that um, 9U board. Feature sizes are getting better. We were down to 1.2 and 0.8. Now we can almost say 800 nanometer. Uh, the total number of PEs was 16K on the MGAP1 and only 49 on the MGAP2. We wanted 64K. We didn't get it, and you'll see why in a moment. We increase the size of the RAM and the double the clock rate, and you can see what happens with the peak performance. And here are some numbers for um, doing different operations. So you can see it would also do DCTs. We did fractal image compression and motion estimation and a bunch of other algorithms on it. There's the MGAP1 plot. Right. Here's the MGAP2, and now you can see why we only got 49K rather than 64K, because there's lots of wasted space in here. Right? Look at that top black row and the bottom black row, right? And why is that? Well, we ran out of IO pins. We couldn't put the number of cells on there we wanted to because we didn't have enough IO pins to feed them. So we didn't have enough pins to fill the chip, so we had to back off a little bit, unfortunately. We took both of these on the road, the arithmetic cube and the MGAP 1 and 2. Remember, there are two generations of each. That's why it took about 15 years of my life. Um, maybe a little more, maybe a little less. We did both hardware prototype demoing and design tool demoing. We were active participants in the SIGDA University booth for um, probably 10 years, uh, bringing tools and showing them off. The hardware prototypes we took to supercomputing uh, and demoed them there. Supercomputing has this great uh, uh, demo area for our universities and labs to demo hardware that they've developed, so we did that. And we also took the MGAP2 to NSF and demoed it in front of members of Congress, so that was kind of fun. Um, the design tools that we developed for, the, for the, both projects were never made available to the design community outside Penn State. I think that was a real shame. Um, uh, and I tried, but I was not successful. Therefore, they never really got the rec use and recognition that they deserved, I think they believed. And in the academic world, that means fame, um, that it's citations for your papers, not fortune. Right, uh, and they didn't get the credit they deserved. So I always, re I, I, I still regret that. So our next design tool that we worked on. So this started after the MGAP one and MGAP two projects were pretty much winding down. Was Simple Power that the students that were involved are listed there. Bob um, was involved early on and then um, didn't get to see it become a product. Was launched in November 2000. It has. It's no longer being used because it's a, an old tool by now, um, but the papers have nice citations and we use the tool a lot. Um, it was our power simulator for many follow-on experience, in particular with Mamet Kandemir. Notice that um, Vijay's name is in the design tool preparation up at the top. I should have said that explicitly. Um, it was our, our power simulation tool, Mamet Kandemir, who's a compiler, person was very interested in compiler optimizations that affected power consumption. And so since it was, uh, it was a tool that allowed you to, to look at uh, input dependent power impacts, it was very useful for doing looking at compiler optimizations impact on power. So, 
And you can see that we uh, branched into the architecture community, so ISCA is there, as well as, of course, the low power. Okay, fast forward. Where are we now? So other than 30 years later. Okay, some of the stars are fading, right? I'm nearing retirement. I, I have a countdown clock, but I don't have it in front of me. Ten days. Ten days. But there's a whole new generation hard at work. Actually, it's more than one new generation. It's two or three new generations hard at work, right? We know that CMOS is near retirement, right? <laughs> In particular, Denard scaling has stopped, so we're really worried about power consumption, right? We're still seeing a little scaling, area, Moore's Law scaling, but that's going to stop, too. We, and it's gotten really expensive, really expensive. There's still funding out there from NSF and Marco and several of the centers, and that's great. But I went back and looked at the overhead rates for the grants from 86 and the grants from now, and the grants from 86 were under 20%, the overhead rates. Our most recent overhead rates were, what, 68%, VJ? 58%. 70, uh, something crazy. Okay, let's assume it's, it's between 60 and 70 almost everywhere in the U.S. That means you have to bring in twice as much money, more than twice, for the same return. And students have gotten more expensive. So that's why, for those of you who are students out there, your faculty are in the rat race of writing proposals constantly because you need to be fed and watered, and that takes money. And it takes a lot of money, a lot more than it used to take because... The university takes that to run your lights, I guess, some, um, something. They do something with it. Okay, so enough ranting. Um, we still have affordable fab at Moses, but it's not at scale. If you just go to Moses and want to do course stuff, it's 130 nanometer. You can pay for more aggressive than that. But it's not 10 nanometer and won't be. And if you're really trying to prove a point, you want to have, do your project at the most aggressive scale that you can get. So then you have the numbers that will make people pay attention. So you really would like to have access to aggressive fab, right? more aggressive than 130 nanometers. There's still great graduate students out there. So that's, that's the one constant in this picture. And it's still Orion. OK. But there are other stars that are emerging. There's a, a whole raft of non-volatile memories. Uh, we don't know what the winner is, and there may be several winners that are going to re be replacing uh, DRAMs and maybe even SRAM caches and other uh, permanent storage. And there's been already a huge impact on the computer architecture community. If you just look at the papers in the architecture conferences, ISCA and HBCA and Micro, and the list goes on, there are bunches of them. There's promise of beyond CMOS transistors with better energy efficient, which may scale below where are we now? Seven nanometers at Intel, and rumors that IBM has a five nanometer process working. Um, stack 3D packaging. Um, if you are, get SIGARCH news, there was an article that Yuan wrote that came out yesterday on Stack 3D, uh, which is a great read. I recommend that you track it down. And I'm going to talk a little bit about alternatives to just chip stacking. I shouldn't say just, because Chip stacking is pretty important. And there are some experimental small-scale academic fab facilities for doing small-scale prototyping and physical device modeling, but not large-scale, some small-scale. And what I should have said in this, rather than new technologies drive new design tools, new designs with new technologies drive new design tools. It's a three-step process. Because you've got to be, I think, engaged in doing design with the new technologies to point out where the tools shortfall is and what you need to be working on in the tools space. And there's this three-part reinforcement that needs to go on. And a lot of the early nanotechnology work that was supported by the National Science Foundation in the US was really focused on the new technologies and didn't have a design component. So once the technology was built, they were done, right? And it really takes people who are doing design, which are the computer engineers and electrical engineers who are interested in doing design with that new technology, to keep talking to those technology people saying, how would we use this? Now we need this. Now we need to make it do this. And that's an important part of this circular reinforcement pattern. 
Okay, so there are lots of Beyond CMOS Fed alternatives. I know I'm running out of time, so I'm going to speed up here, uh, and I'm going to point to people and say, if you want to know more, talk to them because they're in the room. Um, so we, these, this, there's, there are many steep slope uh, tunnel fed alternatives. I have a laundry list here, and I probably left some out. In fact, I'm sure I left some out. Um, but there are more coming on every day, and there will be winners and losers, and they have pluses and minuses. And their, their chief claim to fame is that they have this steep slope, so you can lower the supply voltage significantly, um, which you can't do in CMOS because of leakage without incurring the leakage cost. So that's a big win. Then there's a slide on TFETs, and I'm going to turn into a movie here because I want to get to up some other stuff. Uh, it gets its current generation from man to man tunneling, so you can scale BDD further. You can still keep high drive strength, and the nice thing is that you have this um, steep slope switching, right? so you don't have leakage current. Well, you have much less leakage current. It takes careful choice of materials for barrier, barrier tunneling, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So there's lots of work going on. Um, yeah. Stay tuned. But there are some limitations. It's unidirect these FETs are unidirectional, so you can't do pass transistor logic. In particular, if you look at SRAM cells, you've got to think about that because the read uh, transistors, read and write transistors are, are, you need to, are bidirectional in standard SRAM. Uh, it can have reliability issues for, such as soft air upsets and susceptibility to noise. So I point you to the paper at the bottom that Suman was the lead author on, but I think VJ and Wei Chu were involved on that paper as well. It's a great paper. I read it on the airplane. Well, no, I read it at home and I reread it on the airplane. I think most existing design tools can be modified to work with TFET designs. When I say existing design tools, I'm talking about logic design and layout. Layout will need some pretty dramatic changes just to accommodate the design rule uh, restrictions. But um, no huge change, same sort of gates that we're used to using. Uh, but the question, and this was in a discussion with Jack Sampson last week, will TFETs suffer from wear out like uh, the ferroelectric FETs in particular? That is, as you use them, uh, will they start to break down? Do we have to worry about wear leveling? We have to worry about it in memories. Are we going to have to worry about it in logic devices as well? Right? And providing for graceful degradation and how are we going to do that? And he came up with the term, I can't claim it, something called endurance CAD, which I like a lot. Okay, and then there's Beyond More, and so I see Suman back there. He knows what I'm going to talk about next, I suspect, because I'm a watcher at this point, not a doer in this space, but I, I have some colleagues that I watch closely. And so here's a, one, a great Beyond candidate. This is the work that Suman and Vijay and their, their uh, group of graduate students have been working on. William has worked in this space, too. I think William's in here. There he is over there. And I don't know if Suman has students in here who've worked in this, but... Um, I've communicated with them via email. Uh, so a coupled oscillator array um, in, where individual oscillator outputs are synchronized due to a coupling effect between them. This is just something that happens. So I'm going to show three, a three-way coupled oscillator, although they've been working in pairs because this is a bit more illustrative. So what you see is you see three patterns that are similar but not identical, and the coupling, allow, uh, the coupling between the the capacitors, the vanadium dioxide, allows them to, to couple and end up with the same pattern. So you let the physics do the computing. So if you take the output from a pair of capacitors and you look at it, and what you want is if they match, you want the output to be zero, right? The blue column up the diagonal, right? That's what will happen if they match and they synchronize together. And if they are far enough apart, and far enough, ask Suman, um, they do not sync together, and you get the red and yellow patterns on the upper and lower parts of the, of the rectangle. Actually, it's the square. What are they good for? Well, they're good for associative processing. In particular, they've looked at a bunch of applications in image processing. And design tools for what? I don't have an answer for that yet, and I don't know if they do, because they've just started on this, but it's coming. They're doing a lot of simulation at this point. So they ran an experiment looking at edge detection uh, of this little squirrel image uh, for a 3 by 3 grid of pixels. So they're looking for 
what is the similarity between the center pixel and its neighboring pixels because if there's if there's difference of a particular type that tells me that x0 is an edge of the picture and so they looked at doing it on coupled oscillators so they have eight planes of oscillators uh, this pair of os this this coupled oscillator system two oscillators um, and then what comes out of those couple oscillators is some signal that gets thresholded and then fed into an exclusive OR, where if they're identical, the exclusive OR output's zero, right? Because they're identical. And uh, then feed that to a self-counter. If the counter comes out with zero, that says this is an edge. This is not an edge, right? And if they're different, this may be an edge. And then there's a standard way of doing this in ASIC. And this is another paper that, this is a paper that came out in 2014, Sekula, it's the other student I've communicated with, this is also uh, Suman and Vijay's work. Um, comparing via simulation the oscillators and uh, uh, the CMOS accelerator at 11 nanometers, and you, they got a 20x reduction in power consumption, and um, not counting the oscillators about that in logic, as I recall, there was almost half a million transistors in the CMOS accelerator and, I don't know, 750 or under 1,000 in, uh, in, the, in the CO implementation. Um, a question for me was, and I kept looking at this, it says other computation including, and then it got truncated, and I went back to the source and it's truncated there. And I was like, okay, what can this be? So by process of elimination, the multiplier in the, look, the lookup table is what was not included in that. So if you look at all of that, and the multiplier lookup table is going to be fairly large. And remember, you have eight of these. So, Okay. And then they've used it for color detection, and I've run out of time, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really turn this into a movie. But it, they have done color detection using three coupled oscillators. And the most recent paper talks about six coupled oscillators. And I think beyond that, I'm not supposed to say, so I won't. Um, this has been funded by the NSF Expeditions Grant that VJ is leading. And this is work out of Suman's lab. So this is one of the examples of the prototyping lab. So that picture in the center is a blown up picture of the coupled oscillators. And he can give you information on dimensions. I don't know. Um, and that's work that is funded out of the E2CETA project that they have funded. So it shows you the various test setups, et cetera. So this is work that's going on in the lab with fabrication and then being used in design simulations at this point. Okay. And then there's a project in combining the two, which is why I was doing the movie. Okay. So that's, okay, that's not supposed to be animated. Oh, actually... I'm not sure what happened there. Uh, there, that was a slide that was supposed to be in hide mode, I think. So there's, there's um, no, there's 3D, I, there's 3D IC stacking, which is the work that I talked about that Yuan did, multiple individual device layers. I think this, I did more animation on this before I sent it to Jennifer, okay? Because the figure is from uh, some work that VJ sent me that shows you a picture of uh, IC, a device stacking where you either turn the upper um, um, wafer upside down or right side up, right, for doing the through silicon vias. The, imp the important thing is about this takeaway is that these are pretty large vias, right? And then there's another way to look at it doing monolithic IC, that is doing sequential device layers which allow you to do dense vertical connections. Now ignore the wording down that came up at the same time. Look at the picture, okay, and you can see, unfortunately this was not scaled, VJ. So they look, the one on the right looks much bigger than the one on the left. What you have to do is imagine, right, if that MOSFET on the right is shrunk down to the same size as the ones on the left because they would be the same size. What would happen to the height of that picture? Okay, um, so just keep that in mind, and I, didn't, I couldn't find any way to make that work for me, that, that is to scale it myself. Um, the restriction on this is what you, what you use in the sequential device layers has to be a low temperature process, otherwise you destroy the CMOS at the bottom. Right? 
So it doesn't work for everything, but it does work for thin films, uh, for geranium on insulators, for n some non-volatile memories, possibly for coupled oscillators, right? There's a lot of stuff that it will work for, and it has advantages if you look at that figure again and start to compare across through silicon vias and monolithic, and you look at the diameter size, the height size, the alignment accuracy, there's some pretty big wins. It's not going to give you the general purpose stacking that you get with, with the, the approach that we're starting to see come out of industry. But for special applications, it has, it has promise. This is the delay comparison, which shows you monolithic 3D in the um, solid blue line as the capacitance goes up in the inner die stacking. Uh, routing stack plus through silicon um, via T TSV delay, right? And then the equivalent of just doing a one um, millimeter metal route on chip. So pretty significant uh, space wins and time wins. This is work from Marvin Chang. I told you everybody had a Penn State connection and they pretty much do. Marvin was a master's student of mine long ago at Penn State and uh, he, did, uh, he did some great work in looking at memory architectures and modifying them to improve their power performance. And I couldn't talk him into going on for a PhD because his wife had just graduated. They went back to Taiwan. He worked for industry for a while, and then he went back to school and got his PhD, and now he's a faculty member at Taiwan and doing great. Um, and we see him occasionally. He came back and spent six months with us last summer, and we, we talked to him fairly often. And he's working in this space. One of the things he's done is he's looked at uh, putting non-volatile logic on top of regular logic to use it as a data movement storage location if you're doing power down and power up. Uh, because you've got, say, a device that's in the Internet of Things and it has no uh, power supply and it has an energy harvester and it has to be very energy stingy. And so what you want to do is save state quickly and easily, turn everything off, and then when it needs to come back on, restore state quickly and easily. So you're stacking non-volatile memories on top of um, the digital logic. And you can see a picture of, of the, the memory cell at the bottom, the seven transistor memory cell. Uh, he's done a whole bunch of this. So this is a movie. Uh, there are multiple, multiple, you can integrate multiple functions and it gives you a small form factor. So this work started in 2013 and he's done, I'm not gonna go through all of this. I've got one I will show you. Uh, so the goal is at the top to end up with having the sensor, that is the input output device, the energy harvester, the memory, Right? And the compute, both analog and digital, that has to go on the bottom, right? Have that all together in one package. And it's not just simulation. This is sort of where I wanted to end. He's been working with the National Nano Device Lab in Taiwan, which is an open research service environment with complete nano device manufacturing and test. So, in fact, that one design that was shown on the previous one, but you couldn't see it because it was so small, which has um, the works in the middle, right? And that is the digital logic, ambient life uh, energy harvester uh, out of silicon germanium uh, carbon. And on the bottom is the non-volatile memory storage for saving and restoring state. And there is a, actually it should be bigger than that, but so you can see more there is a picture of a cross-section of the actual fabricated part to show you that they did do it. It says two micron there, so it's not particularly aggressive technology, but it is aggressive if you think about what they're doing. Okay, I'm done, finally, and too long. Oh, five minutes early, but 10 minutes too long. Um, and I'd be happy to take questions if you have them. Thank you very much, uh, Jenny, for the nice presentation uh, and the talk. Uh, we have time for maybe a couple of questions. Or you can talk to me afterwards. If you have anything to ask, please uh, go to the nearest uh, mic and um, ask. Okay. Maybe I'll start. You know, okay. so since you have been uh, around in academia for more than, um, about four decades, yep. Uh, we have a full room of students and younger faculty members. I just wonder what kind of advice you may have for them uh, career-wise. Okay, so I, I think I said it on, 
Let's see if I can get back to that slide quickly. And I didn't draw it correctly, but I'd say don't just work in CAD, right? This enlarges your portfolio, the plate that you have to work with. Think about trying to do design and, if you can, new technologies in CAD because they reinforce one another. And if you can't do new technologies right away, do design in CAD because I think the best CAD tools come out of the design, the needs of the design. And if you're working on CAD tools in isolation, you may be solving a problem that doesn't exist in the design world. So, uh, and that means you have to play in two communities, and that can be exhausting. Um, just ask people who are both active in the architecture community and the EDA community, or people who are active in the technology community and the EDA community. It means twice as many conferences to go to, twice as many places to publish, maybe that's good. Uh, but it can also be uh, consume your life. And I'm ready to be consumed by other things. <laughs> All right, questions from the audience? Go ahead. Sorry, I have one. Thank you, Jenny, for the very interesting and inspiring talk okay. to see what happened in the past and how we have to still do the same, or at least people try to do the same. So one question I have is on the new technologies that you mentioned, fabrication. So you have shown this example of type 1 for new technologies, but in the end, you really want to make the comparisons with 11 nanometers, 7 nanometers. You still need to work with companies. So how, how can you have managed to engage with companies for so many years when they have a completely different path, they don't want to really find alternative technologies, they want to really make sure that their technology is the one that works. So that's a little bit of a, what type of, let's say, advice can you give to the new young yeah. people? Unfortunately, I have no magic wand for that. I think it's a big problem. I was really, I was really interested in the experiment that Taiwan has run, and, and just having something like that available in the U.S., I don't know what's available in Europe. I think you're, you're, um, you're, work with industry may be uh, be more expansive than ours. Um, But it's a a problem and it's an inhibitor because I really think being able to work at close to scale makes a difference. It makes a difference when you go after funding. It makes a difference when you go out to the press because of the numbers that you can use. And if you can't do it at scale, it's, it's less motivating for students as well. So... I wish I had a magic wand. I don't. And I don't know that any amount of government funding is going to help solve that. That's really going to have to work in partnership with industry. I'll right. leave it for the next generation and the next. <laughs> All right. I guess before we end, oh, go ahead. Oh. So what are you going to do after retirement? <laughs> okay. So the question is, and I get this a lot. It's usually from the guys. It's like, what are you going to do when you retire? Like, there is no life after work. Trust me, there's life after work. I'm going to turn back into a multidimensional person. When you start on faculty, you become pretty much unidimensional, maybe two, right? You do your job, and, and you try to keep your family together, right? And if you're a woman, there's, there's even more of a load there, as all of the women out here can testify, right? Um, and that pretty much takes up every second. And if you have an extra second or two, you try to do something to keep you physically in fit, both brain and body, and you have time for nothing else. So before I started at Penn State, I, uh, I was a pretty good bridge player. And I haven't played bridge in years, but I'm back at it. Shish Paul is as well. And, um, and, you know, I was a pretty good classical pianist. I haven't touched a piano in 40 years, so maybe, maybe there'll be a chance to do that. So there are lots of other things I can do. Trust me. I won't, I won't be bored for a minute. Okay. Uh, lo- all right. Before we end, I want to uh, present him oh, for the you. great uh, presentation. Okay. And also, other otherwise, this is uh, our uh, symbol of uh, appreciation from IEEE Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. I guess we should do it official. Thanks. Thank you.